Hello, and welcome to today's webinar with the America Israel Friendship League called Shamir War, Peace and a Dream. We have a wonderful panel with us today from um, across Israel who will be sharing a lot of insights into Israel's seventh prime minister, Yitzhak Shamir, who some of you may know a lot about, some of you may know very little about, but we're here to learn all about his early life and his career um, from many people who knew him personally and others who knew of him very well. And we'll hear insight into a new film that just came out. Um, for those of you who would like a copy of the film, please email us um, as soon as you can at webinar at AIFL.org. We're happy to send you a link to view the entire film. Um, we'll also put that information in the chat for you. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Naomi Reinhartz. I'm the Chief Development Officer of the America Israel Friendship League. I'm calling it today from Boston. Um, as always, we love to know who's with us in our audience. So please put your name and your location in the chat feature on Zoom and on Facebook Live. Um, tell us what you know about Shamir, if anything, um, and tell us how you remember him as a leader, as a statesman, as a politician. Um, I will like to show a short clip, a trailer of the film for you to get a sneak peek at the film, and then we'll go into an introduction of all the panelists. So please enjoy. <clears throat> מתח עצום באוויר, שרון רפול דורשים שמיד נפעל. שמיר, כל הזמן המחשבות חולפות בראשו. אמר בקצרה, אני החלטתי, מוכרחים לחזל אותו. לא הייתה שום ברירה אחרת. נערכה תוכנית שלמה, אפילו אחת מהאנשים של שמיר שעה לצורך זה במצרים. כשהם מגיעים, אנחנו צריכים לא להקשיב ולא לשאול. אם חס וחלילה טיל אחד יגרום לנו קורבנות, גם אני לא אוכל להתאפק. משטרה דמה. שמיר אמר, תודה רבה לכם, הישיבה נעולה. נגמר. אצל יצחק שמיר, התיישבת, ניגשים לעבודה. הוא אומר לי, היום אני כועס עליך מאוד. אתה מדווח לי רק פנים אל פנים בארבע עיניים. בייקר הגיע, הוא אומר לי, אני מעריץ את האיש הזה, שמיר. ציונות כפי שהוא הבין אותה. היא הייתה שני דברים, הארץ, ארץ ישראל ועלייה. המהלך הזה של שמיר היה מהלך היסטורי. הסיסמה הזאת שאין מקום למלחמת אחים, היא הלכה כחוט השני בתוך הבית. לא יעשו חומרים שעומדים בפני לחצים. בעניין הזה הוא דמה בעיניי תמיד רק לבן גוריון. עמוד שדרה כזה קצר כמו שלו, אי אפשר לכופף. So I hope that that sneak peek trailer got you excited to watch the film um, later on this week. I know, it, I know it riveted me when I watched it for the first time. Um, we want to introduce the panel, our first panelist, um, the son of Yitzhak Shamir. Um, Yair Shamir is trying to log in. He's having some technical difficulties, but I'll um, introduce him briefly and hopefully he can join us by phone or video in a bit. No, I, um, are you I'm on? on? I'm on. Wonderful. I'm on the phone. Wonderful. Can you introduce yourself to the audience? Okay, thank you very much. Sorry for the technical problem. And my relevance, as it was said, I'm the son of Yitzhak Shamir, proud son of Yitzhak Shamir. Um, I was born in, uh, in Israel to two freedom fighters, my parents, that were member in the underground Lehi, the fight, the fought the, the British uh, occupation of Israel. Later on, I served in the Israeli Air Force for 25 years as a pilot, as a commander, and as an engineer. And after retirement uh, from the Army, I'm taking positions of CEO or chairman of the leading companies in uh, either high tech or other industries, and mainly in uh, governmental uh, owned uh, companies among which there was El Al, Israeli aerospace industry, and many others. A few years ago, um, I joined, uh, I, I served in two and a half years 
as a parliament member, a Knesset member, and also the Agriculture Minister of Israel. Today, I am managing uh, and managing partner of a leading uh, private equity by the name of Catalyst. Um, that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you for being with us today. Um, Noah Cacharel, can you introduce yourself next? Uh, Noah uh, can't uh, hear us. Uh, some of the uh, technical problem. Okay. Um, so um, Noah, Noah, I'll just introduce for the audience. She's in Israel. She's dedicated to the development and marketing of films. And she's been very successful in helping filmmakers um, get their films um, watched and made into huge successes internationally for over 15 years. Um, Noah, if you do hear us, please let us know and, and feel free to, to share as well. Um, next, we will hear from Igal Lerner. Please introduce yourself. Yes, I hope you're hearing me. Yep. Uh, okay. Uh, Noah sent me that she, she can't hear you so far. Um, I am a cross-platform storyteller. I think this is the best uh, way uh, to introduce myself, as, uh, you know, uh, as I can uh, tell. A uh, proud father for four kids. Uh, this is uh, one of uh, the room of one of them. Uh, making the documentary projects, uh, academic uh, teacher, and uh, doing other things. And but the, the main last thing uh, for the few last years was the this very important project about uh, our seventh uh, prime minister, with my. Uh, Sam, I, I call him the, my brother from another mother, uh, Ernst Friedman. Uh, so I, I'm leading uh, the, the story to him. Good luck for all of us. Great segue. Erez, can you introduce yourself? Yes. Um, I, uh, the commentary uh, creator, uh, former um, uh, oh. producer at the IBF uh, spokesperson, all of the media of an IDF spokesperson, uh, teaching in the College Adassa in Jerusalem. Uh, uh, proud of my family. I'm a father of uh, three uh, kids. And my family uh, is uh, 14 generations in uh, Jerusalem. Wow. And Martin Kramer, please introduce yourself. Uh, thank you. I'm Martin Kramer. I'm a historian by profession for many years at uh, Tel Aviv University, in more recent years at Shalem College, which is Israel's first uh, liberal arts college where I was the founding president. I, I research the history of the Middle East and Israel. I dig in the archives. I write articles and books, and I try to get to the truth. Um, let me say up front that I never met Yitzhak Shamir, like most Israelis of my age. I watched him on the stage during all the many years that he served as minister and prime minister. He was uh, prime minister twice from 1983 for a year and from 1986 to 1992. Uh, but I claim no special intimacy with the subject with this exception. I've known Yair Shamir uh, for many years. Um, and he admitted from his, his uh, bio that he is also the chairman of the, um, of the Israeli board of, uh, of the Shalem College. So I've probably given more thought to Yitzhak Shamir's legacy than most historians of Israel. And uh, perhaps that's why I've been asked to say a few more words about Yitzhak Shamir to open, to open our discussion. Now, let me emphasize, this webinar is no substitute for watching the film. The film is a very rich collection of witness testimonies by people who knew Shamir and who bring him to life as, as a fighter, as a statesman, and as a family man. Uh, we can't do that in this webinar. So this is an invitation to see the film. It is not a substitute for it. So please watch the film. Um, I'll start with an odd fact. You know, Every so often, some Israeli news outlet ranks the prime ministers of Israel. And of course, Ben Gurion always comes in first. He's followed by Menachem Begin. But something curious happens when it comes to Yitzhak Shamir. When the people polled our panel of experts, that's historians, academics, journalists, Shamir ranks well down in the middle, maybe eight out of, out of 12. But if the polled are everyday Israelis, he ranks much higher, 
not far behind Ben Gurion and Begin. Uh, just last spring, 1400 Israelis were asked to rank uh, prime ministers and Shamir placed fourth out of 12. Uh, this sample of Israelis ranked Shamir higher than, higher than Yitzhak Rabin, Shimon Peres, Arik Sharon, Golda Meir, Ehud Olmert, and Ehud Barak. Now, as you know, it's the experts, it's not the public who fashion the narrative. And they have their favorites. There are whole research centers devoted to Rabin and Peres. There are biographies of Sharon and Meir and, and Netanyahu. But there's nothing about Yitzhak Shamir. There's no research center for sure, but not even a published biography. And for a historian like myself, that raises fascinating questions. Why are some leaders remembered and others left to be forgotten? Why is there a gap between who the experts celebrate and who everyday people celebrate? And why, why does this change over time? Now, in the discussion, we will return to this question of why Yitzhak Shamir had to wait so long, even for a film. But I'll propose a thesis to open. And the thesis is this, uh, the experts, unlike the public, have a hard time focusing on how Yitzhak Shamir made a difference. Now, the surest way to make a difference is to win a war or to make a peace. There was a war on Shamir's watch, the first Gulf or the Kuwait war, which threatened to spread to Israel. But as the film uh, shows, it didn't spread. And because Shamir kept Israel out of the war, he isn't considered a war prime minister like Ben Goyon, 1948, or Levi Eshkol, 1967. Uh, there was also a big peace conference on his watch, the Madrid conference, but Shamir didn't reach any peace agreements, nor did he try. And we'll see why in the film. So Shamir isn't considered a peace prime minister like Menachem Begin or Yitzhak Rabin. Shamir averted war and he avoided peace deals so among experts, Shamir is seen as someone who averted and avoided the things that make leaders great. In war and peace, leaders roll the dice and they change history. Yitzhak Shamir never rolled the dice with the fate of Israel and under him, history simply moved forward. Now, if that's the case, why does every male and every woman, the public remember Shamir so favorably? Because there are two things most Israelis want from their leaders. They want them to avert war if possible. And they want them to shun peace deals involving concessions, which put them at risk. They don't want leaders who roll the dice just because they want to go down in history. They want leaders who can stand firm and preserve the security and the territory that Israel has won through hard struggle. And Shamir did just that. He was cautious and unbending. That's what most Israelis want and admire. But in his many years as prime minister, Shamir didn't just preserve Israel, to the contrary, he totally transformed it. On his watch, the Soviet Union fell and its Jews became free to leave. They might have gone to America. Yitzhak Shamir invested all his political capital in making sure they came to Israel. A million Israelis and their descendants, which is about 20% of the Jewish population, arrived in Israel thanks to Shamir. He was the greatest promoter of Aliyah since David Ben-Gurion. And Israel looks as impressive as it does today, demographically strong, technologically superior because of that Soviet immigration. Now the experts take it for granted, the public doesn't. They remember it as miraculous. And that's another reason they score Yitzhak Shamir so highly. Now I say that in retrospect, of course, the irony is that many of these immigrants actually voted against him at the crucial moment in 1992. And another irony, it was the far right that brought him down. The people who should have most appreciated him didn't reward him politically. Only in retrospect do they realize and celebrate him. So Shamir's reputation has grown, grown over time, which I think is a tribute to him, but also a critical commentary on the prime ministers who followed him. Now, you'll hear a lot about Yitzhak Shamir's early struggles and personal qualities in the film and in this discussion. And they make for good stories. But to the historian, someone like myself, what really matters is this. Did he make a difference and was it for the good? I think the answer to both questions is an unqualified yes, which can't be said for all of Israel's prime ministers. So let's hope this film is the beginning, the beginning of a reevaluation of Yitzhak Shamir 
one which will do justice not only to him, but to history itself. And I open the discussion. Thank you so much for that introduction, Martin. That was very interesting. Um, just so you know, we're getting a lot of comments in the chat. Some people um, seem to know Shamir personally and have very positive uh, memories of him. Others say they don't know very much about him at all. And I think that's true actually of a lot of Israeli leaders. We've done many of these webinars on, on some of the leaders you mentioned, some who are very well known, others less so. And I think this film does a really important job of making Shamir a more well-known figure, not only to Israelis, but to people throughout the world. So thank you for making this. Um, Erez, I'll turn it over to you to hear why this film is important, why this film was made, and why make a film about Shamir now in, in 2022. Okay, uh, Shamir was a unique uh, example of uh, leadership from his days uh, till uh, our days for some reason, uh, mainly three, at least uh, three. Shamir uh, served his uh, nation and uh, country for 60 years, most of his uh, long life. He didn't uh, look uh, for a political career like most of the politicians. He was uh, the just uh, guy at the right uh, place at the right time, like uh, Shaul in the Bible, who uh, went after the mayors and uh, found the kingdom. Shamir uh, took um, from the underground Lehi and from the Mossad uh, two main values, very important uh, values, the value of uh, serving till the end and uh, self-sacrifice uh, from the national uh, uh, cause. Uh, he kept, uh, as a politician, a distance from a public relation and uh, from uh, media in general. It's very weak, especially these days. Uh, his legacy is about uh, the do the right thing, not publish the popular thing. Uh, Shamir was uh, a man of truth, very rare these days. He was uh, courage enough uh, to speak truth, especially when it was hard and because it was hard. Uh, so uh, we found uh, Shamir a very interesting, very important uh, person and his legacy is uh, must uh, be learned. Uh, uh, especially for the young generation who uh, don't really know who was Shamir um, and the importance of his uh, uh, legacy and example. Uh, if I may, I think I, I uh, told uh, about the man of uh, truth. I think it's time uh, to watch uh, a clip that we made from the movie when uh, former Prime Minister Ehud Olmer tell, uh, telling uh, about um, uh, an event during a tough uh, conversation between Itzhak Shamir as Prime Minister and the Secretary, uh, State Secretary, uh, James Baker. Can we, can, can we watch uh, this uh, clip uh, right now? Yes, we'll show it right now. היות והיו איזה קשרים מסוימים עם חוסן מתחת לשולחן כל השנים, נסענו עם שמיר להיפגש עם חוסן בחווה שלו או במעון שלו מחוץ ללונדון. האווירה הייתה באמת דרמטית באותם ימים, כי היינו על סף, ההרגשה שלי הייתה שאנחנו על סף החלטות מאוד קריטיות לביטחון ישראל. היו חילופי דברים בין... סגן הרמטכ"ל דאז ברק לבין זד בן שקר, שהיה לשעבר הרמטכ"ל של צבא ירדן. זו הייתה שיחה באנגלית. אני קלטתי חלק משום שזה היה לצידי המפגש העיקרי בין שני המנהיגים. הירדני רמז שירדן תתנגד בתוקף ובכוח לכך שישראל תעבור מעל ירדן. ולמעשה אמר שהירדנים יתקפו מטוסים ישראלים, ואז אמר ברק, אם כך יקרה, לא תהיה ירדן. אני הרגשתי שאני אומר משהו ששמיר לא יכול להגיד, וכמובן לא שני אזרחים אחרים, ושהוא נדרש באותו רגע. בשלב מסוים 
ראש הממשלה הציע שהם ייפגשו יחד לארבע עיניים. הוא יצא אחרי ארבעים רגע. הוא לא שיתף אותנו במה שהיה. הוא, הוא אמר רק דבר אחד, לא תהיה מלחמה בין ישראל לירדן. זה יהיה נכון לומר שראש הממשלה הציל את ממלכת ירדן. He decided uh, not to do this, promised Hussein that we are keep Jordan alive. And he kept his uh, uh, promise. Uh, after that, I suggest we can uh, uh, watch the other clip uh, with our donor. But uh, meanwhile, I think uh, Igor wants to say something. Batumia, I want to, Batumia, I want to ask first. Either way is fine. So let's do ladies first. So Noah's back with us and she has a wonderful photograph of Shamir behind her. Um, Noah, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us about your role with the film and, and what you knew about um, Shamir um, on a personal level? You've got to unmute yourself. Just, yeah. Okay, so hello everyone. I sincerely apologize for all the technical difficulties. Uh, my name is Noah, my Noah Kasherel, and I'm the Films International Sales Agent and also the Films Israeli Distributor. Um, it's a great honor to be with you today. And um, well, uh, personally, uh, when I was growing up, it was uh, a golf, uh, the Gulf War, it was in uh, 91. I was just a kid, but I remember Shamir as, as a leader who I could look up to. He was an icon for me. He was a rock. He was definitely someone whom I could trust. And also this was a general atmosphere in Israel. Shamir cared about the Israeli people. He didn't care about politics. He didn't care about his chair. He cared about the safety of the Jewish people, by the way in Israel, but also in the States and, the, and in the diaspora. So we had scouts, you know, we had missiles, but at least I remember, I felt safer knowing that Shamir was in charge. We had someone to admire, someone to uh, uh, trust him. You know, trust is something that is so important, you know, believing in someone that he will direct Israel. And the fact that he decided and, and not to attack him, um, I think it speaks volumes of him as a leader because it's very easy to get, uh, you know, to get, to, get, uh, to get caught in a war. I think it's much braver not to step in it. And if you can, it's like be more diplomatic, which is, which is what he's done. And I think that he's not only served Israel, but he also served, as we've seen in the clip, the state of uh, Jordan. And I think that his actions have really served the entire Middle East. Really, so that's basically about me and Shamir. Thank you for that. And I think we want to show a second clip now as well from the, from the film. And I would actually be happy if Yair could introduce that clip. Yair, are you with us? Yeah, I'm here. Thank you, Yair, for joining us. We're very honored to have you with us today. Um, can you introduce the, the next clip that we'll be watching? No, I don't have to add anything. Okay. It's the clip about Baker. <laughs> so we'll, we'll, no, show, but... we'll show the clip and then we'll speak with you after, after we show it. Baker dafak al ha-shulchan v'amar nimas lanu l'anasi nimas v'atem kol pam shu ba lekan arik shon v'asei itnachaluyot v'modiim al zeh v'zeh mevich otanu v'zeh itmargiz otan asi v'chule v'chule hu dafak al ha-shulchan Shamir istakel alav b'mabat makpi v'agabot shelo 
שגם ממילא היו די בולטות ככה, הזדקרו קדימה כמו שני סכינים וחיצים. והוא אמר לו, שר החוץ, שלא תרים את הקול שלך פה. אתה מדבר עם ראש ממשלת ישראל ועם ראש העם היהודי. בייקר היה בהלם. ואז הוא אמר, אני מבקש סליחה, אדוני ראש הממשלה. הוא אמר לו, אוקיי, בבקשה, תמשיך. So yeah, here we don't we don't often have the son of a prime minister um, with us on our webinar. So it'd be really interesting, I think, for us and for the audience to hear what it was like to grow up the son of a prime minister um, and such an important leader um, and the head of the Lehi underground and, and later an elite Mossad unit. So can you share us um, some tidbits about what your upbringing was like with him? Okay, so um... <laughs> I'll start from the beginning. Uh, when I was one year old, my father was arrested by the British and was uh, sent to exile in Africa. When I was two years old, my mother was arrested in order to put pressure on my father who have succeeded to run away from their camps. And it was in Djibouti, which is French ter territory and they couldn't reach him. So my mother got into jail. So I was given to uh, a, a, another family to look after me. Only when, I, when the state of Israel was uh, founded and the British left the country, we all, the three of us, were uh, united again. It was uh, when I was three years old. I, I really, what I can, re I can imagine that I didn't recognize my father, nor my mother at that point of time. Uh, when I was, uh, let's say, at, uh, 12 years old, my father was uh, joined the Mossad and all the family moved to France. Uh, me and my sister didn't like the place. It was not our culture and so on. So we, the kids, revolved and we said we want to go home. So my parents didn't have too many choices. My father and my mother remained in Europe. And uh, we, the two kids, moved to Israel. I was living by myself in, their, in their, my parents' apartment and my sister with uh, in a, sister, in a friend of hers. Um, only when uh, I was already a pilot and I was already, I think, a colonel or less, maybe lieutenant colonel, and my father became the prime minister. At that period of time, I was grown up. I was already a father of that. And the relationship between ourselves were like uh, two friends, one older than the other and more experienced, of course, and smarter. And we have a scheduled meeting every week, only the two of us. And this was great advantage to me as his son. And um, usually it, it consults with me in a certain thing, but other than that, uh, remain just good friend. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and Igal, I know you wanted to jump in and, and you described yourself as a storyteller. So tell us why it's important to tell this story now, the story of Yitzhak Shamir. Okay, first of all, uh, thank you for um, organization of uh, these important things and uh, trying to keep on uh, his memory and uh, legacy. I think it's um, all the, the movie, if we can summarize it in one word, as we thought about this, it's about leadership. Uh, and this is, was the, the main starter uh, when we start our journey. And uh, for me, as a storyteller, every, every project is a story, but it's a kind of a journey. And we didn't have a much information. I think it's one of uh, the most, if not the most mysterious uh, prime minister in the history of uh, of Israel, he, he considered kind of a very uh, great person, uh, not a, you know, a great uh, hero. Um, according, uh, I think one of, uh, uh, speaking about legacy, one of the, his um, uh, main agenda was uh, less, uh, speak less and do more. And uh, this was the, the, the starting uh, point uh, about trying, you know, I think it's also in the States. We started when it was Trump uh, era in Israel. We have uh, Netanyahu. 
and we try to, to figure what uh, happened be before in Netanyahu era. And also now we are between uh, election to election. Now it's, it's going to be the fifth in very short time. And uh, we try to, to see how it was before Netanyahu era. And actually, the, the previous time uh, that the, the Likud was in the leadership party was uh, with Shamir. And we're trying to, fi to figure his person. And like uh, if you saw or read the book, uh, uh, the, uh, the, about the Bollywood, the uh, uh, million uh, dollar, uh, well, uh, the Indian movie, uh, we tried to go uh, to, to find his uh, main station in uh, his previous life in the Lehi and uh, as a Mossad unit and to see and uh, uh, if we can to figure uh, how it uh, uh, figure uh, uh, or trans uh, or influence about his uh, career as the prime minister. And uh, this is what, uh, what, uh, what constrains us uh, to move on. If it's, it sh should be relevant, it should be interesting, and uh, it should be hopefully uh, sensitive and speak to, to, the, to the young generation. And uh, I hope, as you can see later, uh, later on, uh, we, we succeed doing this. You mentioned the, the next generation or the younger generation, and I'm, I'm curious how the next generation in Israel and, and perhaps the diaspora remember Shamir, what they know about him, what they learn about him in school. How is he remembered by Israeli youth? Um, maybe Noah, you could answer that one. You have to just unmute. Yes, sure. Um, well, here in Israel, I guess that Martin will be able perhaps to answer the diaspora, but. In Israel, there are some high schools that are named after him. For example, there is one in Tel Aviv, a new one is supposed to be opened in uh, Herzliya Bezrat Hashem, but he's not such a part of the official curriculum. So now, by the way, we are approaching youth programs in Israel, sorry, uh, like, uh, that, like the scouts, we are approaching the informal youth organizations because uh, we as a minister of education, it's more bureaucratic. So we are trying another way to approach uh, the youth, but now regrettably, most of them, they remember more the uh, Bennett, uh, BB, etc. So this is what's very important for for us to also screen uh, Shamir to them as well, because he is apparently is not that well remembered. Yeah, and Mar Martin, I'm curious um, your take on, on Noah's answer, and also how how is Shamir's legacy as a leader and a politician relevant to today's political landscape? Um, someone in our chat asked us to how we could compare him to Gorbachev, who of course um, recently passed away, and, and perhaps other leaders of our times, um, if that's relevant. Uh, I think Noah's right about his um, his reputation in in Israel. Um, there is no institute for a research center commemorating him. There is for Menachem Begin, but there isn't for for Shamir. And that th th those institutes are very important. They're like presidential libraries in America, uh, which do so much to perpetuate uh, uh, the legacy of um, of leaders. And it doesn't have anything that's equivalent. Um, I do sense in Israel that there is in the wake of um, disappointment in prime ministers that we've had in the past decade or so, or more, uh, a longing for his style of leadership. And that's why his, his standing has risen in these uh, polls, as I indicated, when people ask, him, ask the public who, uh, how would you rank prime ministers? But there's still no, very little in the way of formal, um, uh, of, of formal commemoration of Yitzhak Shamir. There's an annual event, of course, and prime ministers often speak in, 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 in these commemorations as Yair knows all too well. But to my mind, it isn't enough. Um, there's also the question of um, the way in which diaspora Jewry uh, remembers him. Remember that Yitzhak Shamir came out of nowhere for American Jewry. Um, he's not someone who had, uh, who had been in the public eye all that much before he came to political prominence. That's because remember, for years he was a um, he was a, a secretive and clandestine operative for the Mossad. 
Uh, I once drew this comparison. And he, Yitzhak Shamir was born in the same year as Abba Ibn. Abba Ibn and he were born in 1915. Abba Ibn became hugely famous among American Jews because he was also ambassador, of course, to Washington and to the United Nations, and then foreign minister during the Six Day War. Uh, Abba Ivan um, was um, in the Encyclopedia Judaica, which appeared in 1970. There was a whole column devoted to Abba Ivan. There was nothing about Yitzhak Shamir. And if you'd asked someone in 1970, or, or even 1980, who was more likely to become prime minister, it would have been Iban or someone else. It wouldn't have been Shamir. So he took American Jews by surprise. And I think also when he did become prime minister, American Jews were uneasy with his uh, relationship with uh, George Bush and the tensions in US-Israel relations. American Jews tend to prefer prime ministers who get along famously with American presidents. Uh, the Robin Clinton model is a good example. So I don't think American Jews knew quite how to take uh, Yitzhak Shamir. And, uh, and so a lot of work remains to be done there. And I think this film will do it. Now, you ask again about um, what we learn about his, his legacy from, um, uh, from his actual deeds. Um, there is, I think the thing I came away with from this film is that you never really know what's going on behind the scenes. Um, and it's, it, it's, it's problematic to rush to judgment and you have to get some perspective, some historical perspective. And I'll give an example of this, which was mentioned here, the decision not to go to war um, and not to launch an operation against Iraq. In the film, we learned three things that you might not have known. First of all, and it's been mentioned, that would have meant going to war with Jordan. The Jordanians said, we'll have no choice. We'll have to fire on your planes if they fly over our territory on the way to Iraq. And that was a decision which was made in a private room between, um, between Shamir and King Hussein, that there would not be a war, which meant there would not be an operation. Second, as is revealed in the film, the chief of staff was asked by Shamir if we have any military options in the Western Iraq to suppress the rocket fire. And the answer he got was no, there were no military options. And the third point is that, um, as was revealed in a cabinet meeting, by Shamir. He said, basically, Bush told me that if we launch an operation, then the American operation against Saddam will, uh, will be called off. So all these things happened behind the scenes. Prime Minister could not get up and tell the Israeli people, we would have a war with Jordan if we make an operation. There are no military options, and the Americans will stop their operation against Saddam. He couldn't say those things, but they were all crucial factors in his decision making. He was under tremendous pressure because Israeli said, why are we sitting in our hands? We're being attacked. It's our ethos to respond. It's Shamir's ethos and personality to always respond, not to engage in restraint. Why? He couldn't tell the story. He couldn't give the public the real rationales. And uh, so I think part of the legacy is that, you know, what the public sees isn't always what the prime minister sees. And, the prime, and, and, that, and we elect the prime, prime ministers, we give our confidence to prime ministers knowing that they will make decisions that sometimes will seem to us strange, out of character. Um, and, um, and I think that, you know, in, in this respect, look, sh hopefully we'll never have a prime minister like Shamir. Why do I say that? We don't want a prime minister whose family was destroyed in a Holocaust. We don't want a prime minister who's, um, who had to go underground and live in hiding from an imperial power. We don't want a prime minister um, uh, who was sent into, into exile. We're a sovereign state. Our leaders aren't expected to undergo that, that, those kinds of traumas uh, in future. So we don't want a prime minister um, like Shamir because we want our prime ministers to be informed in a confident, independent, sovereign Israel. Uh, but what we do want is prime ministers who know, like Shamir, to take in all of the information. And even if he's going to be unpopular in the decision that he makes, to make that decision. That I think is his legacy. Thank you. And you mentioned the, the center. Do you think there should be a center created for Shamir like there are for some other leaders there? Look, I think that certainly there should be a, a full length uh, biography. Um, in the film, you'll see that someone has done a PhD thesis on Shamir and he's interviewed, but uh, that's far from enough. So we should have biographies. There are a couple of, as it's interesting collective volume on Shamir, which I have right here on my desk, which in which various people have this kind of material should be made more available in English. 
Um, and, um, and, and, you know, most of these centers are, are created, have been created soon after the departure of, um, uh, from the scene or from life of leaders. It's hard to do it many years later, but I think that, um, that there should be more symposia. Events like this are usually important and we need them both in Israel and the United States. Thank you, Igal. Well, following to the very important things that uh, Martin said, imagine a situation that the states been attacked by missiles and not responding. Okay, actually it was the first time that Israel was attacked by missile, the center of Tel Aviv, since the independence war, okay, in 1948, and doesn't respond. And by whom? By the Lehi leader, you know, very uh, considered very militant person, but for the first time he's going against his instinct. Okay, speaking of how, about leadership uh, and uh, speaking about uh, not taking the uh, popular uh, strategic uh, decision, not uh, what uh, the, 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 the public opinion said, but what is important, and as Martin said, what is important and uh, not everybody know. And for the second time, a few months later, he going against, he going against his instinct and uh, to Madrid committee and the peace delegation with, for the first time with uh, Jordan, in uh, Syria and Lebanon. Uh, and, and this is, I think, that the main thing about uh, leadership. And therefore, we tried uh, to focus in that year, particularly 91, that uh, unfortunately uh, brought his uh, lost a few months later uh, in 92 uh, uh, to Rabin. Mm -hmm. And if we spoke for one, one more sentence to something relevant to these days, it's against about the right wing that uh, also now people uh, said on reference to that time, uh, saying not not um, let's not make the same mistakes like uh, 1991 uh, election years that uh, brought uh, the the, uh, the left parties uh, because only the the the, the, le the right wing the, the, when it's divided uh, then uh, then he, then he lost the election. So this is, I think, maybe the maybe the cost of being a brave leader, okay? Uh, that you you can uh, you need to take as a consider that you may lost. Yeah, and Yair, I know that you've described your father also and his connection to the startup nation, a, a famous book, and now just a code name for Israel that so many people around the world know. So can you tell us a little bit more about the connection um, that he had with startup nation? Okay, thank you. Uh, there are two activities that are related and totally, I would say, under Shamir achievements. In, in order to change the, or turn around the Israeli economy from a low-tech and agriculture-based economy to something that is what is today, what is needed? First, you need manpower to address all the needs of thousands of startups and so on. And he have done it. He worked since the 70s. He working on let my people go. This was the activities to let the Jews to leave the uh, ex USSR and to come to Israel. And on the way, you, it will be also mentioned in the film. On the way, m many of those Jews, including American organization, insist that once the, the Russian or the USSR, ex-USSR authorities will let them go, they will be free to choose whatever they want to go. And my father insists that they are not uh, uh, stateless uh, refugees. They have an homeland, which is Israel. So they first have to go to Israel. If later on they will decide to leave to another country, they can do that. There was a first fight and my father won on that. And as a result of that, 1.2 million Jews arrived in a very short period of time into Israel, absorbed in Israel, which was crazy, as Martin have said, 20% of the population. Big portion of them are professional that's relevant for the high tech industry. And they become basically the foundation of the pillar for the high tech uh, nation or the startup nation later on. The second activity is you, you have manpower, that's fine, 
but you need a lot of financial resources. So Yitzhak Shamir, as prime minister at the beginning, and later on, or the beginning as deputy for the prime minister and then as my prime minister, established a fund owned by the government called Yozma, or English Initiative, that gave unbelievable uh, favorable uh, terms to foreign investors. And, it, and a lot of people jump on that opportunity. And this opened the door or the gate or whatever you call it for flood of billions of dollars that finance and give the fuel to this locomotive that was idle. And then we become uh, the startup nation. And that's, that's what happened in the years, ni- the early nineties. And later on, 10 years later or 20 years later, you can see the fruits. And this is Israeli economy based on innovation, based on technology in all fields, agriculture, healthcare, financials, whatever. And we are leading worldwide in numbers and uh, in achievements. So that was, nobody can take those achievements from him. Of course, of course. Um, Erez, I want to turn to you to learn a little bit more about the making of the film as well, the, the technical aspects, um, how long it took, who was involved, um, and also where this film perhaps has been screened and where you hope to screen the film in the future. And maybe Noah can chime in there too. Right. Um, the story uh, uh, in the movie is uh, told by um, uh, very uh, uh, important and interesting uh, people that were uh, very close to Shamir uh, during his, uh, his job as a, as a prime minister, uh, uh, speaking about uh, four, uh, two former uh, prime ministers, Ehud Olmert and Ehud uh, Barak, uh, two uh, former uh, Mossad, uh, uh, heads of the Mossad, uh, one uh, a former head of the Shabak and uh, a judge at uh, the Supreme Court and, and uh, uh, more and more. Uh, they tell us about uh, Shamir during a uh, process of the decisions that he made, made about war, about peace. Um, they telling us about his, um, his personality as they uh, uh, knew him. Uh, they uh, tells us the story of Yitzhak Shamir that he himself wasn't tell about himself uh, during his uh, uh, life. Uh, so we can believe uh, uh, to uh, the story that the uh, movie uh, um, uh, present uh, for us. And uh, I think it's better to uh, watch the movie. It uh, you know it talks it talks by it, by itself. So watch the movie. Amen. Thank you. And and Noah, where has it been screened, and where will it be screened um, around the world? Well, yes. Well, so far we've been lucky. We have been screened in the Miami Jewish Film Festival and also in Australia Jewish Film Festival. Also, we've been there in Sydney, Melbourne, and in other locations throughout Australia. We've also been to Buenos Aires and to, we will be in Montevideo very soon. And uh, we will be in Sao Paulo um, in the end of uh, this year. Uh, we've also been in uh, Philadelphia and East Bay and in New York and in Boca Raton, also in Texas, Baruch Hashem. So it's been uh, good. Uh, and now we are also working on future cooperations, hopefully with other organizations such as Stand, the Stand With Us, that will help us get to universities and colleges throughout the USA, because we really are interested in the younger generation. Uh, so hopefully this will indeed materialize. We are also in contact with the World Zionist Organization to reach more Jewish communities, we are approaching more Jewish film festivals, even Jewish museums. Um, and by the way, suggestions would be warmly welcomed. Anyone from the audience who wishes to bring the movie to his or her community or to its synagogue or museum, 
please, please contact us. My name is Noah Kasharel. You can contact me via a Facebook email. You can get my contact details from this organization. And please, that will be amazing because we're really keen on promoting Shamir's legacy because he's done so much for the state of Israel, but also for Jews worldwide in the diaspora. And it's very important for us to do it, especially this year, which commemorates a decade to his passing. So please, if you have any ideas or comments, please contact me. I can see why you're good at your job. You're a good marketer. Um, we, <laughs> we have a couple of people. I do it with all my heart. I really believe in it. I really admire Shamir. I consider myself as a, as a messenger. Of course. We have two people in the chat who have already offered. One asked, when it will be screened in Israel and another offered Broward County, Florida. They have a film um, series that they would probably be interested in this film. Amazing. That Thank you, can, you can connect offline. Um, I know we also had a question um, about uh, Itzhak Shamir's wife, Yair's mother. Um, not many people have parents, both of whom have been arrested when they were young. <laughs> so, um, I, think, I think people might want to know a little bit more about your mom, Yair, and, and any others um, of the panel who have memories of her as well. Okay. So uh, as there is a saying that uh, behind every successful man stand a smart and talented woman. This is the case with my parents as well. <laughs> so uh, basically um, my mother gave my father the space of activities that he was involved with big sacrifice, uh, sacrificing her own career. She was very talented. But uh, let's say for her history, when she was 18 years old, she decided to run away from her home in Sofia, Bulgaria, and to uh, become an illegal um, appeal or immigrant to, to Israel. Uh, she, she took a lift to, uh, to Romania, and from Romania she took a very bad situ situated uh, ship, and they reached uh, the coast of Israel, was arrested uh, with all the others uh, by the British. She spent uh, 18 months in jail. In this period of time, she get to know other resistance or underground guys, and she basically was recruited to the Lehi when she was in uh, jail. When she left the jail, she became the messenger of uh, my father, which she didn't know before that. Two years later, they got married. And, uh, and uh, since then, they are together. They were together for more than 66 years. She gave him a very strong back for anything he is doing with a lot of sacrificing. As we said, she, uh, we had the kids were in Israel, she was there in order to help him. And uh, also in the politics, it's not, not really an uh, easy life for her. But, and she has done everything. She has done, uh, he was uh, working on the outside, outside world and she was on the inside. And, uh, but their love is, was famous in Israel. So. That's wonderful. Yeah, and I agree with that quote, the first quote you, you said about uh, men and women. Um, I know we're, we're nearing the top of the hour. I want to make sure um, the panelists have um, a final minute or two to share any last thoughts that they have that they haven't shared about Shamir. And just so you all know, we're getting a lot of really amazing comments in the chats on Zoom and on Facebook. We're getting a lot of email requests for the film. Um, again, for those of you who didn't hear earlier, if you'd like a copy of the film, please email webinar at AIFL.org and we're happy to share it with you. Um, so let's hear any final thoughts from, from the panel before we close out. Um, Erez, let's start with you. Uh, I uh, admire Shamir uh, during his uh, life and I miss him these days. That's what it, uh, I can say. Iga. Um, thanks. First of all, um, I use a sentence that uh, the son of Yair is a grand uh, son of uh, Yitzhak uh, said once that uh, Yitzhak Shamir uh, fought for greater good. And I think it's uh, very important, especially these days that people, especially leadership, uh, not thinking or mainly thinking 
about uh, their uh, political uh, service. And he was kind of a lighthouse uh, and uh, keep on uh, with his own uh, path uh, and way. And the uh, main three things, um, others spoke about uh, nostalgic uh, thoughts. Um, I think, first of all, it was modest. It, uh, something that we cannot see or very rarely these days. Uh, he was a secret keeper. Okay, not uh, telling much about his uh, historical uh, activities or even as a prime minister. And he was a team player, not uh, changing his uh, crew every two, two, two days in a week. And uh, he, he thought and moved on uh, with people that not many thought, uh, many thought like him, uh, right or, uh, or left, but were professional and like him. Uh, as I was told before, were uh, men and truth. And we are not historical, as uh, Martin said before, we are not a historic person or have a PhD degree or something like this. Uh, we are a storyteller and we hope uh, we provide kind of a archeological part uh, that can uh, support uh, his story and his legacy uh, to the next uh, generation, many years uh, on. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Martin. Uh, our view of the past, you know, it's always changing. And uh, what's interesting is that in the past number of years, two Israeli prime ministers have been subject to reevaluation in a positive light. That's Levi Eshkol is one, and uh, Yitzhak Shamir is the other. I think that process has just begun. And I think this film makes a huge contribution to, um, to that reevaluation. And I wouldn't be too, too modest about the film as history. It is itself a historical document. It is full of firsthand testimony. And by the way, this was not mentioned, but for, you see, you'll see a film of an hour and a half. There are more than a hundred hours of recordings of people talking about Yitzhak Shamir. It's an archive. Uh, another film could be made and yet another just on the basis of what you fellows have collected. Uh, so, um, um, so I, I see it as a film which could inspire more historical research, more historical writing, more biographical inquiry. And so sometimes, you know, these kinds of things emerge from the work of historians who get a subject going again. Here, I think it's been done by filmmakers. And so I'm going to congratulate again uh, our filmmakers for doing a splendid job. And uh, I hope that, um, uh, that we'll reconvene again at some future time. And there'll be even more to discuss because the archive will be still richer and our knowledge will have expanded. Thank you. Amen. Noah. Uh, well, Yair says that um, Yitzhak considered himself as Misharet Bakodesh, which means that he viewed himself as a servant. He didn't, he was very modest, very humble, and what he cared about was the Jewish people and the state of Israel, and he considered his job as sacred. And hopefully we will have more leaders like him. Martin, in a way, what you said before, of course, we don't want exactly people like him. We don't want leaders whose families were in the Holocaust, whose families perished in the Holocaust, but Shamir was indeed an icon. If we can inspire future generations to follow his footsteps, to follow his ideals, then this will definitely be a better world, Bezrat Hashem. Really, the, and, and it's not up in heaven, it's, we can all achieve it. You know, just if we focus on other people, and not about ourselves, each one can be Mesheret Bakodesh. Each one can serve in sanctity and actually, and try to bring good. Really, this is my message of the film. Thank you. And yeah, you're the final word for you. Yeah, it's, uh, for me, my father is a role model for leader. Um, honest, modest, uh, with determination to achieve his vision, he is ready to take any steps, courageous, and with the 
huge. It was mentioned also, it's mentioned also in the film, unlimited ability to withstand pressure from outside, from inside. He doesn't care. He has his own way and he goes there. But he has enough flexibility for compromising along the path to achieve his vision or to achieve his goal. And I was a minister. I've seen that to be a minister in Israel, to achieve your goal is extremely difficult. And when I look backward about my father, what he achieved, it's incredible. Incredible. It's a long list what he has done. So for me, it's a role model. And I hope that for the next generation of leaders, because today it's not the case, this will be their role model as well. Thank you so much. Thanks. And thank you to all of our panelists for joining us. I, I know I learned a lot personally. I can't wait to watch the film myself. I know our audience um, is very eager to watch. Again, um, please email webinar at AIFL.org to get a copy of the film. You can only watch it through um, September 2nd and 3rd um, this weekend. So please make sure you watch it in time before it expires. Um, thank you for making this film. Thank you for bringing to light um, the seventh prime minister of Israel. And I know a lot of us are eager for to learn more about him after this webinar. Um, so for everyone watching in our audience, thank you for joining us from around the world today. Stay tuned for our next webinar this Sunday where we'll have a virtual art tour with our um, wonderful uh, panelist, Gabriella, um, who will show us some wonderful Israeli art. Um, and thank you again for joining us. Please follow us for our future programs and we'll see you hopefully this Sunday. So thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a nice day. Bye-bye.